Thank you. Hello and welcome to Genius Tea Time with Olivia Pepper. Really, this is wonderful. I'm so excited that you can become part of this. Um, Olivia, in their own words, Olivia Pepper is a writer, a disabled and tired person, and a hereditary witch and ritualist who seeks to engage fully with enchantment wherever possible. Olivia was educated within the same magical traditions as Leonora Carrington and Alejandro Jodorowsky, and will most be, be drawing from this tradition for this talk. Olivia currently resides in rural southern New Mexico and has dabbled abundantly in life and has been, at various times, a film producer, a medicinal herb farmer, an astrologer, a journalist, a labor organizer, a teacher, a line cook, and all kinds of other things. Mostly, though, Olivia is a collection of exhausted cells, weary bones, good stories, bad jokes, and oddly sentimental pieces of pop culture trivia, mostly about Star Trek or queer poets of the 20s. Welcome, Olivia. Would you like to tell us about the organization that we're going to be benefiting today? So it's the Chihene Ende? Nade. Nade. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah, Chihene Nade is a tribe of the Nade people who are working toward achieving federal recognition. And they are part of the overall Nade nation, and they are the custodians for the land that I typically reside upon. Today, I'm speaking to you from Ute territory, uh, where I'm visiting Zaina, who went to college with Pam. <laughs> Just as a little side note, we didn't realize that they knew each other until I brought them into the same room. It was very exciting. So yes, Chehene Nade Nation is working to achieve federal recognition, and um, they will hopefully achieve that within the next year or so. You know, you can never can tell how long these things are going to take, um, and the Indigenous struggle is very real. But one of my beliefs as a mixed Indigenous person uh, who is possessed of light-skinned and white-assumed privilege, I um, believe that it's very important for us to not just give lip service to the people whose land we are residing upon and teaching upon, but actually to pay what I think of as land taxes. So whenever I have the opportunity, I pay the chihin in a day um, so that I am paying my land tax for living and working upon their land. That is wonderful. Um, and later on, I'm going to find the, the place where you can find the land on which you reside. So that you can plug in whatever your coordinates are and find out whose land you're on. Thank you. And if you'd like, get started. Yeah, thank you all so much for being here. And big thanks to our ASL interpreters today. Um, please let me know if my pace works for you as interpreters or anyone else. If I'm speaking too quickly, let me know. Um, I really value accessible spaces, so I'm really happy that these happen over Zoom, and I just want to thank everyone for being here. A tradition that was taught to me by my colleague, Justin, who I teach ethnobotany with from time to time, Justin likes to share a little bit about who he is and why he's qualified to teach the things that he's teaching. So just a little bit about me in this context um, is that I became interested in theater at a very, very early age. I was also brought into, I was unschooled for my whole childhood. And I was unschooled by very counterculture people. And I was brought into some ritual high magic traditions as a child because I became very interested in those subjects. So I've been studying this for over 30 years. Um, and what qualifies me to give this offering is that this is just a passion of mine that I've had for years and years. I'm very interested in artistic history and theater, and I'm very interested in politics and the way that spirituality and politics align. And the main reason that I decided to focus on this time period from the 1870s to the present day with regard to this form of theater is that I really noticed something interesting happening as the world became a bit more secular 
um, and also sort of more diverse and more expansive in terms of people interacting with each other, the context for ritual and occult theater became very different than it had once been. So before I jump into the time periods that I consider myself to be sort of a, an amateur expert in, um, amateur because it's something that I love from the French, amour, amateur, one who does what they do for love. <laughs> um, before I get into that, I'll just speak briefly about where we believe theater comes from as a tradition that we understand it in the so-called Western artist tradition. Now, all around the world, all people, all indigenous people, indigenous to any land, practiced some form of religious psycho-spiritual initiation or ceremony. This is true of every human being. What we kind of understand as the tradition of Western theater, most historians agree that it emerged from the Dionysian rites, which were an ancient ritual for the passage of time and the initiation of various levels of magical knowledge or spiritual influence within a community. Now, we practice rituals all the time and still do, right? Weddings are rituals, funerals are rituals, graduations are rituals, and they are forms of ritual theater. When I talk about, and I use a few different terms to describe what I'm talking about. I use ritual theater, occult theater, and sometimes surrealist theater or absurdist theater, which it becomes a little hard to separate them all from one another in this time period. They all kind of start to run together just a little bit. But when I'm talking about ritual and occult and surrealist and absurdist theater, I'm talking about an experience that is constructed by typically outsiders, societal outsiders, that is intended to evoke a sense of mystery, a sense of awe, and a sense of connectedness between participants. So there are lots of different forms that this ritual theater has taken and it is all the world. There are really distinct traditions of ritual theater in the Australian Aboriginal communities. In India, there's a form of ritual theater. Um, there are many forms of African ritual theater. We see examples of ritual theater in many of the religious traditions of South and Central America. Um, so I'm only going to be talking about this tradition that is mostly white, but not entirely, um, that is mostly based in a, an emotional psycho-spiritual response to the forces of imperialism, capitalism, and colonialism, which is why I find it so interesting, <laughs> because it's one of the ways that artists have kind of responded to this lack of, of present and available cultural ritual. So what I thought we would do today, because I have kind of collected a lot of favorites over time, um, I've read a lot of history, I've looked at a lot of these books, I've conversed with my teachers, some of whom worked directly with Leonora Carrington or Alejandro Jodorowsky, um, and I've looked through, yeah, all of these records, and I thought I would just kind of take us through a few of the bright spots in this ritual theater tradition in Europe and the Americas over the past 150 years or so. Um, just wanted to introduce you to some of the major players. So where we will start is um, 1870s going to about 1900. And we're gonna look at England and the Order of the Golden Dawn, which some of you will be familiar with. The Order of the Golden Dawn is the organization that the famous occultist Aleister Crowley was known for being a part of. He split away from this organization to form the Lima, his own religion. Um, this is where Arthur Edward Waite uh, was practicing and working 
um, and he is involved in the creation of the Rider Waite Smith tarot deck, um, which was illustrated by Pamela Coleman Smith, also known as Pixie, who was very involved in ritual theater. So the Order of the Golden Dawn was a um, influenced by what they called the Egyptian mysteries, which were not really Egyptian. They were more um, presented during a time when this group of white upper class colonists were very fascinated by the communities that they had effectively um, controlled and owned for this point. And a certain group of people began to kind of idolize Egypt and the Egyptian mysteries. And they really, um, a lot of them were Russian uh, occultists, and they really kind of actually made up a lot of details about these Egyptian mysteries, and then were kind of um, cosplaying in this idea of what they thought it was like to participate in the Egyptian mysteries. Now, some of this was based in what we know to be the Dionysian rites or various other Greek and Roman traditions that were part of this um, Southwest Asia, Northern Africa tradition of high ritual magic. So this is also connected with the Freemasons and their sort of degrees of initiation. So this type of ritual where there were special costumes and these kind of um, deity embodiments where they would dress with a mask to appear as a certain god or wear all of one color to invoke this god. A lot of this was kind of coming in a fairly uninterrupted tradition that was kept very private and very secret and was part of Masonic initiation rites for potentially over a thousand years. The Masons are notoriously kind of secretive about their you know, origins and histories. It's a community that conveys a lot through just oral history and there's a lot of secrecy around it. So we don't totally know how long they've been practicing certain things. They say that it stretches back to the Dionysian rites and before. Um, but in terms of the Order of the Golden Dawn, which was essentially a, a secret society as well, but there was a particular figure um, named Samuel Liddell McGregor Mathers. And Samuel Liddell McGregor Mathers decided that these initiatory rites should happen in public and that they should be brought back into the public sphere rather than taking place in private. Now, the reason for this, um, is a little bit difficult to kind of describe in our contemporary terms, but the name McGregor is a Scottish surname. And now I think, especially those of us who live in the so-called United States here on Turtle Island, we don't have maybe a very nuanced understanding of British colonial history within that landscape, but the Scots had been oppressed by the Romans and then by the English crown. And so McGregor was a name that Samuel took back for himself. So he was born Samuel Mathers. And McGregor to connect his own indigeneity essentially. And these rites that they would lead were considered to be uh, Celtic ritual initiations that were happening deliberately to affront the church. So for the first time um, with the Order of the Golden Dawn, or I shouldn't say the first time, but the first time that we have a long trajectory, there were multiple occultists who were interested in reviving pagan experience and pagan life. And they were interested in bringing these symbols as they understood them to the greater public and challenging the idea of a proper England and a Christian England. So a lot of what they would do for these public rituals was that they would have challenging occultist ritual presentations at churches sometimes in churchyards. Um, Samuel McGregor Mathers was particularly known for um, almost having like 
<laughs> flash mobs at churches, although that's not what they were called at the time. But um, he was known for bringing together people from the Order of the Golden Dawn and getting robed up and coming into church services and then disrupting them and sharing various chants, sometimes also sharing um, what were themes that were inspired by Scottish and Irish liberation. So Scotch-Irish liberation songs or old chants relating to the freedom of the people. And of course, this is coming immediately after the Great Hunger, which, um, was a, a starvation event brought on by English oppression, which had um, killed many, many people in Ireland uh, and some in Scotland as well. And so some of what they were doing were rituals to settle hungry ghosts um, because of the people who had been starved out by the English. So they would perform punishing rituals for toward the rich, even though they were also from the upper classes. They were, everyone involved in the Order of the Golden Dawn for the most part, were people who came from upper class backgrounds who were interested in divesting from their circumstances of power. And they were also interested in diversifying participation in their community. So one thing that was interesting about the Order of the Golden Dawn is that women were allowed full participation with men. And that was very unusual for a secret society at the time or even now in many ways. So um, this was co-ed and it also was open to people of color. Um, Pixie is a person of color. Uh, many people don't actually know that but she was a mixed race light skinned woman. Um, she participated in the Order of the Golden Dawn. They also, um, Alistair Crowley did leave the organization on uh, unfavorable terms, but he was openly queer and that was something that was allowed within the organization as well. So we're really looking at this group of wealthy outsiders who were challenging or contradicting the circumstances in which they were raised and often very deliberately kind of affronting it. Now, um, Samuel McGregor Mathers ended up married to Moina Mathers, who was the sister of a philosopher named Henri Bergson, who wrote a lot about inequity and a lot about class. And so they were obviously kind of, um, they were both leftists, what we would consider leftists today, and very anti-slavery, uh, very pro uh, women's liberation. They were unusually uh, for the time, they were vegan. Um, they were labor supporters. They were very kind of powerfully interested in achieving equity in the world. So a lot of their public rituals that the Mathers contrived involved trying to bring the imagery of the oppressed deliberately into environments where they were not seen as welcome. And so they were really committed to kind of um, expanding this idea of liberation for all beings. And they are really, I would say that the Mathers in particular are some of the people who inspired maybe some of the humanist traditions in Western magic the most um, because they cared so much about you know, erasing oppression and eventually all people being equal regardless of gender, orientation, race, or class. Samuel McGregor Mathers died in 1918 of the Spanish flu, penniless in Paris. Um, and it's, I like to remember the people who died in the last major pandemic as they often are not spoken about, but that is um, how he passed from this world. He became increasingly eccentric, <laughs> but he also um, served as a mentor to some of the early Paris ritual artists, which we will circle back to in just a moment. So that's our first character that we're addressing is Samuel Liddell McGregor Mathers. An interesting side note about him as well, Liddell, the surname, uh, his mother's maiden name, is the same surname as Alice Liddell, who was the subject of Alice in Wonderland. So this whole um, 
these families were very connected, these kind of artistic, upper class, occultist, magic influenced English families all had all of these kind of interconnections with one another, which is really fascinating to think about. So we're going to cross cross the sea just for a moment and go over to the, the Dadaists of the U.S. Um, and Baroness Elsa von Freytag Lorikoven, who um, lived in New York City in 1906, I think is when she arrived there. Dadaism and situationism both arose as a response to uh, the circumstances leading up to World War I, so to industrialism, to um, factories, to the widening class divide. It's important to remember that the last time the so-called Western world had such a big class division was around this time as we do now. So this was when the first millionaires were minted. We had JP Morgan, we had people making money on the train systems and on land grabs in the American West, post gold rush. New York City is booming at this time. And Elsa von Freytag Lorghoven is a woman from the upper classes of Europe who, well, a person, I should say, um, may not have identified as a woman if given the vernacular that we have now, but was called the Baroness. And Baroness Elsa was well known to be erratic in behavior and would have eruptive sort of screaming episodes, probably was experiencing some degree of mental health distress, but was also a phenomenal artist who was one of the first people to create um, costumes out of trash, out of garbage. So Be Baroness Elsa was known for ornamenting themselves with discarded cans and wrappers from single use food and stitching them together in a very theatrical way with a large needle in Times Square. So one of the performances that we now understand to be a performance but was also maybe a mental health episode. It's hard to tell sometimes, but Baroness Elsa would come out into the street completely naked. Um, and Baroness Elsa also, it's worth noting in starting in 1907, Baroness Elsa, we don't even actually know how this person did this, but would keep their hair dyed bright green. This was not common. There was no over the counter hair dye. But people remark on it in their journals from the time that this person had very short hair that was colored bright green all the time. So Baroness Elsa naked with short shorn green hair would come out and would sew a costume for themselves out of pieces of trash that they picked up on the street. They were arrested for public indecency over 40 times because of going back to the same spot in Times Square and making an outfit out of trash. Sometimes they would succeed. They would also wear trash garments to events. Um, they are known as one possible creator of the um, a famous art piece called Fountain, with a urinal signed by R. Mutt. Uh oh, am I glitchy? Did I? Okay, I'm back now. Um, so there's a famous piece of art that is just a urinal signed by R. Mutt. And this was um, one of the major sort of surrealist art pieces, situationist art pieces, art objects of the twenties. And it was said that one of, uh, that a female friend had submitted this art piece. Uh, and one, many people believe that it was Baroness Elsa who actually provided the urinal to the artist exhibition. So Baroness Elsa was a figure associated with the Dadaist revolution. Um, Baroness Elsa was a Baroness, but had experienced a lot of severe familial abuse and didn't want anything to do with the wealthy upper-class elite family that they came from. Uh, but nonetheless, I, sometimes it seems that money came from them from the family that helped to support some of the other artists living in New York at the time and participating in the Dadaist uh, evolution. There were many extravagant performances that people wrote about in their 
journals uh, that we don't have any recordings of, but there are some photographs. So I definitely, um, oh yeah, I'll, I'll answer these, I'll round these questions up. Um, <laughs> so um, yeah, there were recordings uh, or there are records of Elsa's performances, but not any recordings that we know of. There are photographs of Baroness Elsa um, Baroness Elsa eventually returned to Europe and uh, their mental health declined significantly, but they were supported financially throughout World War II by uh, various lesbian and queer artists that they had known. Juna Barnes, who wrote the lesbian novel Nightwood, um, Bryher, who was another upper class well-known lesbian. Um, she... Baroness Elsa knew uh, West, all of the major lesbian players of the time. Uh-oh, I'm stuck again. <laughs> okay, my back. Okay, perfect, thank you. Sorry about the storms sweeping over and uh, rendering our internet challenging. So, Baroness Elsa was supported at the end of their life by this lesbian, uh, queer women's art contingent who made sure that um, to the best of their ability, Baroness Elsa had money to eat and uh, be clothed. Um, but certainly this person was, was a wild sort of unruly creature. Um, and we know from the journal of a woman who had uh, a love affair with Baroness Elsa, that part of these trash costume performances were timed and they were very specific. So we don't know, you know, what type of mental health experiences Baroness Elsa was having, but they were um, magical remediations for male abuse. Uh, Baroness Elsa was essentially a, a misandrist for very good reason. And a lot of the performances were around the oppression of women and femmes and the idea of the body being used by men in power. Um, and so there were a lot of kind of, um, yeah, these challenges that were brought up by Baroness Elsa. And I am very intrigued by the way that the Baronesses labor sort of spread through the community and informed a lot of the art and ritual that was to come. So this person was probably kind of having a, yeah, a personal experience that they were rendering into just sort of a lived embodiment of their pain and anger. Um, but there was also a very important thing for all of these New York City Dadaists to perceive and participate with. And Baroness Elsa really um, owes a lot to that community. So speaking to why Molly asked in the chat, curious why Elsa wouldn't claim ownership of the art piece if they did submit it, there are quite a few reasons that people speculate. Mainly, it has to do with the fact that women artists were rarely accepted to expositions at the time. So it was very unusual for any female artist to be shown in the company of men. And if a female artist had success at the time in any medium, they would usually have to be very delicate and their what they depicted artistically had to be appropriate to the conventions of femininity. So the art scholar that I know of who talked about why this urinal <laughs> was submitted and signed with a, a man's name, R. Mutt, which people have various ideas about why that joke was put there. Um, the belief is that the Baroness was basically saying male art is to piss in, <laughs> essentially, and that she submitted the urinal to be like, this is the state of men's art. And that André Breton, because he was like uh, sympathetic somewhat, decided to submit it and, and show it and center it. Um, maybe he found it amusing. So that's the Baroness. I always want to tell people about the Baroness just because Baroness von Elsa was incredible, an incredible person. Also something that's fascinating about Baroness von Elsa, 
I don't know if this is the origin, but Baroness von Elsa was known to wear fishnet stockings that they made themselves out of fishnet that they sewed up the back of their leg. So they would wrap fishnet from the meat packing district in New York, disposed fishnets around their leg, and then they would tie them up the back of the leg. And I don't know of anyone else who ever wore fishnet stockings before that, but it very well could have been that the Baroness gave us that because shortly thereafter, in fashion, we see in the late 20s and early 30s, the fishnet pattern of stockings begins to kind of come into vogue, along with very short hair and a very flat chest, which Bar the Baroness wrapped their chest, uh, bound their chest, and had their hair short all the time and wore fishnet stockings. And that was in 1907. <laughs> so that's Baroness Elsa and Baroness Elsa's man-hating rage in Times Square which I always feel like is a very important thing to remember. I'm just gonna take a, a very brief, um, well, let's see. No, I'm gonna move, I'll, I'll come back to another favorite of mine who's another gender bending uh, ritualist in a moment. Uh, but first we're gonna just hop back over to Paris into the late, late teens, early twenties. This is where we really begin to see in the post-World War I Paris uh, enclave. You know, Paris has been this rich artistic community for a number of decades at this point. Um, the Moulin Rouge was famous in Paris uh, in the last uh, decade of the 19th century. And Paris, was home to many writers and painters and poets and people were having salons. It was the place to be for many artists. I mean, in some ways it still is, but particularly Paris in the 20s and 30s, things started to become much more unstable. And there were artistic rivalries. There was the massive flu pandemic. There was the Spanish Civil War. There were various wars that were impacting Paris. There were also Paris's uh, or France's colonies were in a state of a lot of revolt at this time. And so a lot of things were shifting in the culture. So around this time, we start to see some really interesting theatrical things happening where they're actually bringing occult and ritual theater into the theatrical environment. A lot of this was based on um, the work of Alfred Jerry, who was a playwright who wrote Uburoi or Uburé in um, 1896. So the theater of Alfred Jerry or the Teatro Alfred Jerry was founded in I think 1926 in Paris. Um, and this is where we start to see a lot of transformative ritual theater that is produced, that is intentionally involving the audience, confronting the audience. A dream play by August Strindberg premieres there in 1928, which is a very confusing, overwhelming play about dreams, about dreaming. There are all of these artists working in Paris at the time, arguing with each other about the meaning of theater and how theater can confront people create social change. So there are all of these people who actually interact with Mathers at this time, who is at this time, you know, uh, an old man living uh, in a state of some confusion. He was a self-described um, wizard, uh, you know, a, a Celtic druid. And so he was living in a state of experiencing uh, these magical, fights with his enemies. You know, he and Aleister Crowley were very uh, against one another and he felt that he was under magical attack. But so he's kind of taken in by this new group of young Parisians who want to create ritual and occult theater that can affect the entire world. So there are at this time, a lot of manifestos written that are like the manifesto for an aborted theater 
is one of the major pieces from this time, which talks about how industrialization has separated us from our true selves. And the only way we can regain our humanity is through a confrontational ritual theater experience. So there are lots of people doing lots of different work at this time. It's just really important, I think, to talk about Paris during this period between the two world wars as being really the place that the tradition of what we now know as occult ritual and absurdist theater all kind of comes together. So there are some really, really important players there, but nobody who is as much my favorite as the people I've talked about. Although one of the people who participated in the Paris scene was another artist named Claude Cahun. Now Claude Cahun was not named Claude Cahun when they were born. Um, they were in partnership with another artist named Marcel Moore, whose name was also not Marcel Moore when they were born. They were both people who identified as third gender. Um, they were somewhat masculine presenting. They had been raised as women. Um, they were participating in this Parisian arts culture, which was very uh, fear friendly and very gender expansive. They were forced to move during World War II from Paris. They fled, fled Paris together and they moved to Devon. However, they had been engaged in a ritual theater uh, work where they became their, their male persona. So if you look up pictures of Claude Cahun and Marcel Moore, you'll see images that uh, involve them embodying this sort of heroic masculine form. They were really interested in engaging with this idea of the like sort of inner binary maybe that they had. So as individuals, they thought of themselves as neutra or gender neutral, but they liked to embody very presences that were masculine or feminine. So um, when they moved to Dover, um, they began distributing anti-war pamphlets to the occupying Nazis, which they wrote, Marcel Moore had studied German at the boarding school that they attended when they were a child. And they wrote in German anti-war pamphlets, and then they dressed in drag as men so that no one would discover who they were and they would go and distribute pamphlets and then hurriedly change back into the appearance of women, which is how they were living um, to escape, you know, sort of the, the challenges. They, neither of them were part of groups other than being homosexuals. They were not persecuted by the Nazis and they were able to um, conceal that fact about themselves by, I think, pretending to be sisters is what they did in order to kind of get by but then they had this, these secret drag performances that they would use to um, get into these characters. They gave themselves new names, which were men's names in German, and they would speak to each other with those names and they would hype each other up and get in to drag together and then go out into the street to try to convince as many soldiers as they could that they should desert and that the war was over for them and that they should stop occupying. So they just did this by themselves. Um, but in the journal that we have from Marcel, there's really beautiful writing about how they became ghosts of young men who had died unjustly in wars. So they allowed themselves to become possessed by young men who had been killed in wars and then went to try to stop war from happening again. They are also very beautiful to look upon, um, particularly Claude Cahun has a beautiful piece uh, from the 30s that involved, um, it was about physical touch and, and kissing and connecting. And the sign that they have on says something like, don't kiss me, I'm in training. 
They have little hearts painted on their cheeks. They're very, they would be perfectly at home stylistically in a contemporary realm. They look like a TikTok couple or something. The two of them, they're very like, very chic, very um, sexy, masculine, cute, weird avant-garde haircuts. They just look like they would fit right in. And so um, part of why I love them so much is because their ritual theater accomplished things. Um, there were actually a couple of people who said that they um, became uh, German soldiers who said they became disenfranchised after reading the pamphlets. So they uh, they accomplished something there. I It's 4.15, so I'm, I'm gonna keep moving. Next uh, phase that I wanna talk about is I'm gonna just jump over to Mexico. Um, and this is where we find my, my teachers. Um, so Leonora Carrington was actually a Brit who was living in Mexico City. Leonora Carrington is well known as a painter, less well known as a poet and playwright, and even less well known as an occultist and ritualist and terologist. But she was nonetheless the teacher of prominent uh, surrealist experimental filmmaker Alejandro Jodorowsky, who is still with us. He's still alive. He's an elder. He lives in Paris. Um, and she was also the teacher of my teacher, Michael, who is not in the world of the living anymore, but he did study alongside Alejandro. Um, and they lived in Mexico City in the 50s and 60s all of this theatrical work is taking place, all of this public ritual. A lot of the work that Carrington did um, was dedicated to dreams and the unreal and the realms of the unknown. And if you look up pictures of Leonora Carrington's dream theater, you will probably find images of the one that they did for Alejandro's birthday, which involves these really elaborate masks for these various kind of like demon figures, um, demons and dream monsters. And um, Alejandro was in one of the costumes. Michael, my teacher, is in another. <laughs> Leonora Carrington taught them about tarot um, and taught them about ritual theater. And they were all very influenced. Um, Alejandro and Michael were both from a colonial white European families that were occupying um, South America. Um, so they came from these families, much like Frida Kahlo's family that had some mix of indigenous and colonizer, but had a lot of money. And so they were kind of like spoiled art kids. Um, Alejandro is from Argentina um, and Michael was from Bolivia. Uh, and they came together and began working with m indigenous theater makers who were part of the, um, the major sort of public ritual theater that becomes very confrontational in the 60s and 70s is with Augusto Boal, who was known for founding what is called the Theater of the Oppressed. And Boal's work is really essential to utilizing ritual and occultist theater to show ways in which society has, again, separated people. Um, one of the things, there are many exercises that were done with, by Leonora, Alejandro, Michael, and Leonora's other students. But a lot of these exercises involved stripping them of various powers that they had. Um, one of the rituals that I know, the ritual theater performances that happened was um, that Leonora brought her male tarot students out into the street and um, poured fake blood on their crotches uh, and had them stand with their arms open all day. Alejandro did this and so did Michael. And it was called, um, something about shame was in the name, the, oh, the, the living poetry of shame, because living poetry, where this, the title of this talk comes from, 
which is also a thing that Alejandro talks about a lot. This was Leonora's express mission in the world was to make people experience living poetry. And so the living poetry of shame was a public attempt to demystify menstruation and also to have her male students understand to some degree what it felt like to be maybe stared at, ogled, critiqued on the street uh, in a different type of body. This is also why if you've seen some of the films of Alejandro Jodorowsky, you may notice he involves menstruation themes a lot. And I think you can see Carrington's influence in that very, very heavily. Um, gosh, there's so much more I wanna talk about, but I'm running out of time. I think uh, I will mention just briefly, um, the, as I said already, Augusto ba Baol and the Argentine theater of the 70s um, is very, very important for creating the context for larger theatrical happenings that demonstrate human rights violations. Uh, the die-ins that we've seen people perform as part of um, HIV awareness and education, and also for the awareness of uh, chronic illnesses like ME-CFS, those, the die-ins are perhaps based in a lot of this work that Carrington and Bowell had in mind when they constructed these theatrical forms. They are public spectacle that is meant to transform the player as well as the viewer and to recontextualize politics. Um, a lot of this also happened in San Francisco in the 1960s, Kenneth Anger, who just passed away, another revolutionary filmmaker, um, a very important queer voice. Uh, Kenneth Anger frequently had ritual theater performances for people coming out. Um, that was kind of known for, and even our, our vernacular of coming out is borrowed from the debutante balls of the American South, which is when women would come out. And so when people began to identify with queerness being something sacred, celebratory, liberatory, they would have debutante balls for new girls when they got to San Francisco. And Kenneth Anger was known for kind of putting them together and creating this aesthetic that was kind of a Mm, like a fun uh, take on high society, but for queer men. Um, so like little finger foods and crumpets and like things that you have to like, you know, be very dainty about and everybody in beautiful uh, dresses and suits. And it was very formal. Um, and they would perform this ritual theater to bring people into the queer community. And it really, from my understanding, from teachers who spent time there, um, as well as the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence, who are a well-known uh, drag community there, uh, a lot of these parties and public rituals really helped strengthen the queer community in the San Francisco Bay Area in the 60s and helped make it the sort of heart of queer culture that it is today. Um, there's so much more I could talk about, but I want to give a moment for anybody to ask questions. Um, I didn't quite get up to the present day, but um, you can follow me. There's lots of people that you can participate with. Uh, Starhawk is a really great contemporary public ritual theater performer, creator, uh, and political activist. And there are many, many people doing really beautiful um, ritual theater work all over the world. So. I wanna, um, yeah, give anybody an opportunity to ask me any questions. I have a lot more in here, apparently. I didn't realize the time would go so quickly. <laughs> it's like that, but this is great. Um, was that, you said there was a book that you could recommend to people? Um, yeah. If you can pop that into the chat and if there's anybody else you think they really should know about and should wanna look it up, please do. Yeah, so this is a, um, the link that I just dropped into the chat is for the Theater of the Occult Revival which is a book that really addresses a lot of this time period that I have talked about today. Um, Alejandro's films are a great place to look, um, but especially he made a film about the process of psychomagic, 
which that's a documentary. And that's a great way to see the living tradition of what I do, what Leonora did, um, and the way that we work with people one-on-one -on -one to use ritual techniques to affect change in people's lives. Um, they do a lot of rebirthing and a lot of, um, yeah, sort of construction of ritual elements that people move through in order to alter their own experience in the world. Also, Alejandro is on Instagram and his Instagram is really funny and really sweet. He does a lot of dancing and um, playing around on the street and I just love him. He's probably 93, I think, something like that. So get it while you can, while Alejandro's still on this side of the veil. Um, other people, I think I've mentioned all the major names. Oh, one name that I would like to talk about at some point um, is Ana Mendieta, who's one of my favorite artists. Um, and she's more known for the images of her work, but her work was very important to the indigenous movement and reclamation of a relationship with the natural world. She's very important to me. Um, and she, if you look up images, you'll find she did a repeated series that was the shape of a, a silhouette. They're called siluetas. And it was the shape of a female silhouette in various natural environments. So covered in flowers, covered in blood, covered in mud against a tree. Um, it was really a deep exploration. And when we look into the context behind the images, there was a profound amount of ritual and theatrical performance that went into all of the creation of her work. Okay. Ah, I see this. So Nightwood was written by Juna Barnes. That's one of the first novels that has an expressly lesbian theme. And it's a great book. It's like a hundred years old, but it's phenomenal. If anyone else wants to put questions in the chat, you are absolutely welcome. And also, if anyone has questions, you know, after this, oh, Anthony Nartad, um, definitely fits in with the Paris group, um, you know, certainly was really, really important in several of the <laughs> Parisian arts movements that sort of changed name and face as often as people had arguments with each other. Um, Theater of Cruelty, I think, was the one that he was really the most invested in. Um, but of course, he had been involved with some of the other theater makers at various points. Um, Absolutely, he's a really interesting for talking about ritual. I think his interest in ritual arose a little bit later and almost came from a, in my, in my experience of his work, maybe came from a more secular position, I think. Um, didn't exactly arise from any sort of a tradition that he was carrying or like a lesson that he was hoping to portray. However, in, especially post, like in the in the 30s, mid to late 30s, he did a lot of um, personal ceremonial work that was actually now, I, I did some reading about this uh, several weeks ago. It turns out that he had a post-viral illness from the flu pandemic and he was treated mm. with acupuncture in the 1930s <laughs> and did a series of performances around it. And um, I was really, became very interested in that. So that was something that um, I'm gonna learn more about and hopefully understand more. So um, I'm gonna look at, at questions real quick. Uh, yes, okay, so Joe, I see that. I think I mentioned everybody. I spelled out a lot of their names for the ASL interpreters. And so I think I got most everyone. Um, and I just mentioned Andre Bergson because he is the philosopher. I didn't really talk about him, but he's Moyna Mathers' brother um, and really creates some of the context for their work. 
I think I mentioned everybody there. Oh, I didn't get to talk about Rowena Kreider. Rowena Kreider was an earth artist, earth-based artist who made large scale labyrinths and sort of secret goddess portals all over the West Coast in the 70s, 80s and 90s. Um, she was a, a friend and lover to many of my goddess tradition teachers. And I have gotten to experience some of her secret labyrinths and her performances were all about um, Artemisian mysteries. So they were reviving these women, women's liberatory theater experiences where they would um, yeah, embody various goddesses and go out deep into the woods and then explore this ritual space together and perform these large, um, large ritual events that often had maybe 300, usually all lesbians um, together. <laughs> they were uh, very interested in kind of creating an alternative world that I think Spirit Weavers Conference, which people still go to, is very based in this uh, sort of tradition that Starhawk and Rowena both had parts in. Um, and hopefully uh, folks will <laughs> remember the um, distinctions between sort of second wave uh, trans exclusionary radical feminism and this type of goddess worship which was, uh, Starhawk is, is not transphobic, which is wonderful to know. And um, they always involved uh, trans women and, and non-binary people in their rituals. It was anyone who's embodying the goddess. So if you were there and you were in drag, you're fine. <laughs> um, now Molly asks, so is, is it fair to assume that this history influences contemporary immersive theater, flash mobs, artists like the woman who sits in silence in museums, and even art like the Lady Gaga piece where she had the artist vomit milk on her during a song. I would say absolutely yes, particularly Lady Gaga. Um, Gaga was given her name and Gaga is a form of theater that spun out of Dada, um, which is very, it's lesser known, but it was like a mid-century queer art form. Uh, and Lady Gaga was given the name Lady Gaga while participating in the New York um, Gaga dance uh, and um, salon scene, so kind of voguing adjacent, like high, high drag, bizarre, uh, repulsive, disgusting. Like those were a lot of the sort of ideas that they, they wanted to have. So Lady Gaga's whole shtick is based in this abrasive, repulsive queer confrontational art form of the 70s. Um, flash mobs absolutely are based in, I would say, the work of Augusto Baal as well as Harrington's work to some degree. Um, but then earlier when I mentioned Mathers and his mobs of druids appearing in the churchyard suddenly, that was done on, at a time. So the clock would strike and everybody would throw off their hoods and that was a thing that was done to surprise everybody who was just going about to church. So I think flash mobs have definitely been influenced like it. Um, and uh, what is her name? The woman who stares at people. She lives in Hudson, New York. Um, and she trained in a line of people who were associated with, gosh, now I'm having trouble remembering. I think that her lineage of training emerges from someone who worked in the Paris group. Um, yeah, so she's very connected with that sort of 20s, 30s. Thank you, Marina Abramovic. Um, yeah, she, um, I, yeah, I can't remember the connection now, but she, she participated in a lot of the 1970s and 80s challenging type of, of stuff. Does Grotowski cross paths with this tradition? I would say yes, Jersey Grotowski, um, was a, a theaterist. <laughs> um, I studied Grotowski method. Uh, Grotowski method is a sort of mm, very embodied form of theatrical performance and a way of learning as an actor that is maybe more intuitive or more emotional. It's a lot of different things that people can say about the various schools. Grotowski was interested in, I would say, transformation as a theatrical concept not necessarily the conveyance of political 
or spiritual information, but more a kind of personal, uh, yeah, personal transformative alchemy, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to be um, aware of the our interpreter's time. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, thank you all for joining us.